This morning I am going to be giving a vision talk. Um, at this point in the year what we would normally do is if we were all gathering together we'd restate the vision of St Peter's and we'd say again what we feel like God is calling us to do in the coming months before we go into the summer and then into the awesome term. But quick announcement before I do that. Many of you will know Andy Coombe. Andy Coombe has been a member of uh, St Peter's for a while now and Andy Coombe has stepped into the considerable void that Sophie Lawson-Jones has left since she's gone on maternity leave. So Andy is our new operations director. So it's a shame we can't get him up on stage and pray for him. We love to pray and prophesy over new members of the staff team, but do email him, WhatsApp him, say hi to him um, on the live message now. It's an absolute um, privilege to have him on staff. He's wildly overqualified for the job role, um, but that seems to be the case for all of our staff. So we're really blessed to have him. So let's be praying for him as he starts that role. So as I said, at this point in the year, we restate the vision. If you have been only coming to St. Peter's in the last few months, um, you may not know the vision. If you've been coming for a while, you will know the vision, but it's a good chance to look at it again and look specifically at what the Spirit is saying to us in this period about our vision. But the vision of St. Peter's is to be a family on mission to bring people home. What do we mean by that? We mean firstly that we believe church should be like a family. It should be a place where people can belong. It's not an organisation that you join. It's not something, an, an event that you attend every week. It's a family that you come to and you belong to. And so we say th three things when we think of family here at St Peter's. We say that it should be a place where you can feel fully known, where you're able to be totally yourself when you come into church. All the good stuff on show, but also all the bad and the ugly stuff that only our family ever gets to see. We can completely um, be open and honest as to who we are. But obviously, in addition to that, we also need to give and to receive the unconditional love of Jesus as a result of that. So if the only way we can ever be fully known is if we also have the unconditional love of Jesus at the centre. But also a part of being a family means that we're encouraging each other to become all that we're created to be, to become the representation, the unique representation of God's image on earth, particularly here in Broccoli and South East London. So we believe that church should be a family, but not just a family for its own sake. Secondly, we're a family on mission. We believe that fullness of life is found in relationship with Jesus. It's only when we come into relationship with him that we know our true identity, that we know our true worth and we find out our true calling and our life starts to explode with fullness and so therefore as a result our mission as a family is to introduce people to him. We do this explicitly through things like the life course but we do it implicitly as well through different ministries that we have going on at church and it's an opportunity always for us to either talk about or demonstrate and show the love of Jesus to other people so that they meet him and then finally this isn't about bringing people into the church, it isn't about numbers, it's not about trying to build something huge at St Peter's. The whole point of this whole process is to bring people into the presence of God because we believe that we are created to be most at home in his presence. Part of our created identity is to enjoy the presence of God every day of our lives and so therefore everything we do at church is to help people encounter God's presence. So on ch a church on Sunday we're helping people encounter the presence of God. We're being filled to overflowing as members of the family of St Peter's and then we're going out and we're taking God's presence into our communities, into our homes, into our workplaces so that other people can experience his presence too. So family on mission to bring people home. For this particular Vision Sunday, I'd like to focus in on one particular outworking of that vision. And um, to talk about this, I just want to set up how we feel God has brought us to this place of feeling like this is something that we need to emphasize at this time. So about two years ago, when Hanel and I were trying to discern and ask God where we should be planting or grafting or where we're supposed to go after our curacy at St Mary's, we had two options on the table. One was in central London, north of the river, and one was the potential, the very beginnings of a potential plant or graft down here 
in South East London and there were a number of families from St Mary's who were asking for a church plant south of the river because they started to have kids and couldn't make the trip up to St Mary's anymore. It was too far to go. And so we gave ourselves a week essentially to ask God to speak to us specifically about these two things. And in order to do that, we had a couple of days where we fasted together, but we also emailed out to friends, trusted friends who, and asked them to listen to the Spirit and to give us words and prophecies about um, what they felt like God was saying for us. And amazingly, during that week, we had five words from five independent people who didn't know the others were praying and didn't know what we were trying to work out, whether it was north of the river or south of the river. Five words from Joshua 1 about being strong and courageous, and the whole passage was essentially about crossing the river Jordan, um, which we took to be crossing into deepest, darkest South East London, which we'd actually never been to um, before. And uh, God spoke in many different ways. Um, on the Sunday of that week, Andy Coombe, who's now on staff, um, actually arrived at St Mary's and I was speaking on the power of the Holy Spirit and I was speaking to him afterwards and I said, why have you come to St Mary's this week? And he said, well, um, me and my friends have been getting together recently and doing church as families together and we're really trying to learn how to start to operate more in ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit and have a church that's centred and fueled on the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So he came to St Mary's to find out more about how to do that. I said, oh, that's really interesting. Where are your group of friends? Um, where are you doing this? And they said, well, we um, actually all live in a little place called Ladywell in South East London, which again, we took to be God starting to speak to us about South East London. Um, a couple of weeks later, Andy actually emailed me um, the job advert for St Peter's. They were looking for a part-time um, uh, vicar, obviously, at St Peter's. And he emailed it to me, so I sent out a text message to Chris Jones, who's now our, one of our wardens here at St Peter's. I said, do you know this church? Have you ever been past this church? He didn't know it. He texted Dave Pilcher. And Dave Pilcher texted back and said, that's the strangest thing. Every day I walk past that church with my daughter, Thea, and I've been praying that that would be the church building that we can relocate into as a group and start worshipping together. So it really felt like God was speaking to us really powerfully about what we should be doing. And so therefore we started pushing doors and everything kind of unraveled from that. However, in that same week, Sunday to Sunday, when we were praying and we were fasting, on the Tuesday night I had a dream and it was one of these dreams where when you're having it, you're not sure if you're awake or if you're dreaming. It was so vivid, I could smell, I could feel, it felt incredibly real. And in that dream, I heard our doorbell go in the little flat we were living in, in Queen's Park. And I went out, got out of bed, went to the door, and I opened the door. And as I opened the door, a homeless man literally fell into our house as I opened the door. And I remember in the dream smelling this homeless man. I remember feeling like slightly anxious and terrified about this guy literally just falling into our house. And then in the dream, what I did was I started shoving the door and trying to push this guy back out the house until finally the door clicked and I was able to shut him out. And at that moment, I woke up out of my dream and I heard the voice of God more clearly than I've heard in a long time. And he said to me, if you go, you need to be willing to let him in. If you go, you need to be willing to let him in. And in many ways, over the last two years, we have seen so much life at St Peter's and we've had so much fun and the church has grown in so many different ways. We've seen people become Christians. We've managed to carry on this incredible sense of family and community that St Peter's has always had as a part of its DNA and a part of its values. And we've set up some incredible ministries and seen God do some amazing things and we've really started to sense God's presence with us as we've worshipped and we've sensed God encountering us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amazing things have happened but one area of the calling on St Peter's which we feel has actually been lagging behind the rest of it has been this ministry to the people on the margins. You've got to let him in. If you're going to go you have to let him in. And it still feels like that dream hasn't really been realised yet at St Peter's and for a number of reasons we've been feeling in the last couple of weeks God speak to us very clearly about our ministry to the vulnerable and our ministry to those on the margins. Quite literally God has been replaying that dream in real life for us here at the Vicarage because of the shutdown and the lockdown we have had an incredible increase of people knocking 
on our doors um, every other day, really, people who are looking for food, are looking for money, who are facing horrific home situations and are looking for hope and are looking for a way out and they've been knocking on the door and we've been trying to help them as best as we can without having really an organized structure of helping people like that. And every time someone knocks at the door, it feels like God is replaying that dream in my mind. I've also made the mistake of telling lots of people about that dream since we arrived here. So people remind me of it all the time anyway. I don't know if you listened to Anne's talk from last Sunday. Anne spent 17 years working with Jackie Pullinger for those really on the margins of society, the most vulnerable um, in the community. And she shared some incredibly powerful stories of people meeting and encountering Jesus and being transformed as a result of being brought out from the fringes and the margins right into the center of the family of God. And I, I don't know about you as you listen to those stories, but as I watch Anne's talk, I found myself weeping as I heard those stories. And as I was hearing the stories, I said, please, Lord, can we have the same stories here at St. Peter's? Can that be a part of our story here? as well. Um, on the Monday following that Sunday, I was reminded of a prophetic word that was given to us as a church by a guy called Pete Portal. Pete Portal works in a township in Cape Town and him and his wife and his kids have a home in this township and they um, invite uh, young boys who have been part of gangs and um, essentially involved in, traf in drugs and in um, all sorts of things in the gang scene. They invite them into their home and in his own words he says they literally reparent them back to life. And so he runs this incredible ministry there. And when he came to speak, he told us about that. But he gave us a specific prophetic word as a church. And he said he feels like so often in church life, there's two extremes. There's either the revivalists who are also all about uh, personal transformation, are all about encounters with the Holy Spirit, are all about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, being transformed from one degree of glory to another, encountering the glory of God as they worship and meet together. And then there are the activists who are out there inviting the vulnerable and the lonely and those on the margins of society in and providing for their practical needs and he says it's so often it feels like you're either doing one or the other but he said the church that God wants and the church that he felt like God was building at St Peter's is the third middle ground it's the middle way of doing it where you're powerfully bringing together those two things you're bringing the activism into the center you're bringing the presence of God into the center and together those things in a in a church together create something incredibly powerful for the kingdom of God and as he spoke this word over us as a church, so many people started crying. So many people came up to me afterwards and said, we really feel like that's a word for our church. I've been reminded of that word. Um, on Wednesday, Andrew spoke at home about love and power, exactly that same dichotomy. Either we're activists or revivalists. It seems like so often we have to make a choice between the two, but he said we need to combine love and power together. And then in the prophetic words that followed in the breakout room, the prophecy breakout room, so many people had words about St. Peter's combining those two together. And Bobby actually shared um, a word where he'd remembered the Pete Porter word and he shared it almost exactly as it is on the recording and said, I really feel like this is a time where God is bringing us into um, really trying to see that word come about in our community. So if I were to summarize all of what we feel like God is saying to us as a church at this time, as we think about the vision of St. Peter's being a family on mission to bring people home, how is that specifically being played out in our church at the moment? If I were to summarize it, I would say it looks a little bit like this. It's time to open the doors of the church, which I realize sounds ridiculous given we're all in lockdown. Um, but what I've been noticing across churches in London and, and the UK in general is the beautiful way in which churches are starting to respond to practical need in their communities. It's almost like the pandemic has just woken up the church to social action again and really started to get the church to focus in on those on the margins and those who are vulnerable and I think for us at St Peter's we should be following the same but God is speaking specifically to us right now to start to open up the doors to those on the margins to the vulnerable who are starting to come to church but also to go out and get them ourselves so I'm going to speak more on that in a second how we do that first why don't we frame it quickly 
Um, in the Bible. Uh, I'm going to speak quickly about Psalm 68. Psalm 68 has been a core part of how our vision has been played out here at St. Peter's. We quote a lot of verse 6 where it says, God sets the lonely in families and we feel as St. Peter's we should be the antidote to loneliness in this area. Um, but there, when, when you read the psalm there's just three things I want to pull out really quickly. Firstly, who are the lonely that the psalmist is talking about here in the psalm? Who are we on a mission? to bring into the family? Who are the people? And when I first read this psalm um, and I kind of felt like it was a part of what we should be doing here at St Peter's, in the news at the time there was a lot of chat about a loneliness epidemic that we were going to be facing as a country and there were lots of stats flying around about this loneliness epidemic. It was going to overwhelm the NHS, we were being told, and the government were um, doing an unprecedented thing of having a, a dedicated minister to loneliness, and the government-led surveys were coming out with crazy stats, like not having a stable, loving connection with another human being was as bad for you physically as 15 cigarettes a day. And the feeling we had as a leadership team at St. Peter's is that church should be the antidote to this loneliness epidemic. But one of the stats that was banded about was that 86% of millennials, 86% of our country who are supposed to be at the height of their relational connection, enjoying life as it is in their prime, 86% of millennials feel alone on a consistent basis. And so that got us thinking about how we could start to engage millennials. And as a result, I think our church has grown significantly with young families and with young people in that age bracket. But in many ways, I feel like my inter our interpretation of that psalm has been a little bit one dimensional. What do I mean when I say that? Well, look at the context of the lonely. Look at who the psalmist says are the lonely in this passage. He says that he has come to be a father to the fatherless. The lonely are the fatherless. The lonely are the widows. The lonely are the prisoners. The lonely are the poor. What does that mean? Well, if you didn't have a father in that context that many years ago, then you literally had no money and you had no standing whatsoever in the social context. You were on the margins of society. If you'd been made a widow and you didn't have a husband in that patriarchal context, you had no money, you had no rights, you were on the fringes of society. If you were a prisoner, it goes without saying, you had no money, no rights, you were on the fringes of society. If you were poor, therefore, you weren't able to be at the center of the family unit. And God, the psalmist is saying through, uh, God is saying through the psalmist that these are the lonely that I want you to bring into the family. Those that have been shoved to the margins. Those who are the least, the less. When I was studying theology um, before my ordination, we had a series of lectures on the Gospel of Luke and particularly Luke 4, where Jesus sets out his manifesto and echoes a lot of what we read about in this psalm. He says, I've come to bring good news to the poor, to set the prisoner free, to release the oppressed, to open the eyes of the blind, to inaugurate the year of the Lord's favour. And there was this huge debate that we had in this particular class because we compared Luke's interpretation or Luke's recounting of that passage where Jesus stands up in the temple and quotes from Isaiah with Matthew. And in Matthew, we're told that he says, I, this, I have come to bring good news to the poor in spirit. Whereas in Luke, he says that I have come to bring good news to the poor. And so this big debate goes, is it about the literal poor or is it about the spiritually poor? Which one do we have to choose? And of course, the answer is always, it's both and. It's both of them. It makes perfect sense. Why would it be one or the other? And that plays right into this word that Pete Portal gave us, this sense that we feel like God is calling us into. So who are the lonely? Yes, the lonely are the millennials. Yes, the lonely are those who are spiritually poor. And we're all spiritually poor in so many ways until we meet Jesus, until we find relationship with him. But particularly the poor are the fatherless, the widows, the prisoners, the literal poor, those who've been shoved right to the margins of our society and our context, who are starting to come out of the woodwork now during this shutdown we're starting to notice them more in our communities so next question how are we supposed to help them if that's who the poor are if that's who the lonely are in this psalm what is our response well the common response is that we think we need to start a project 
for those who are on the margins. We think that we simply need to provide for their practical needs. And therefore, if we start a project or if we give money to another project that's happening in our community, then we'll start to live out this calling here in Psalm 68 and uh, reiterated by Jesus in Luke 4. And there is nothing wrong with projects. Projects are brilliant. And any local initiatives that are trying to provide for the poor, those on the margins are brilliant. And we give money to things like that in our area. But I believe that the call on the church is far greater than simply setting up a project because the whole point of this psalm is that we're not bringing those who are lonely on the margins into a project to provide for their practical needs. Instead, we're told that God takes those people and brings them into a family, brings them into loving, intimate connections and relationships with people in the family of God. Our church is called to do so much more than just serve a need. Our church is called to bring people into the family, to adopt them into the family of God. So much of this is written about in the New Testament, isn't it? Because of what Jesus has done, we become sons and daughters. We're adopted into the family of God. This is how Paul puts it in Galatians 4. He says, but when the time, uh, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might also receive adoption into sonship, into daughtership. What's he trying to say? We says under the law, it's like you're ticking boxes to get into the family of God. It's like you're trying to do certain things in certain ways ways so as to be accepted in the family of God but he said it's so different now Jesus has come we don't need to do any of that he's fulfilled the law if we come to him then we are literally adopted as sons and daughters into his family what's the result of that the result is that of that is that we see we receive his presence in our hearts we're able to call him Abba Father Paul tells us but since we are no longer slaves he said but God's child since we're his child God has also made us and this is key he says he's made us an heir what does that mean? It means that we receive the inheritance of all that it means to be a part of the family of God. This is what we're called to bring the vulnerable into. We're called to bring them in to become children of God as they receive the same inheritance that we receive as being in the family of God ourselves. When we lived in Bristol and I was at Theological College, we started attending a church called Hope Chapel in Bristol, an amazing church run by an incredible couple called Silas and Annie Crawley and it was so different from any church we'd ever experienced before. The first Sunday we went, we arrived and as you come in the front door they'd laid out croissants and breakfast for everyone and next to the table was a, a wet room and a shower where homeless people were going in and having their shower for the day. Everybody was sharing in the breakfast together. You go into the congregation and as we sat down I was sitting next to a doctor and on the other side of her now was someone who was coming off dependence of um, drug addiction and alcoholism and the whole context of this church was that it does not matter where where you have come from. It does not matter what you're struggling with, whether you're from the margins of society or whether you are from what the society might perceive to be the doing really well in society. When you come to church, we're all in the same family together. We all inherit exactly the same inheritance because Jesus has paid for everything and we pay for nothing ourselves. And so this is the most incredible, even on the staff team, um, I remember um, on uh, their caretaker essentially was someone that Silas had found in the woods. He was on a walk and he saw a tent and there was a guy in a tent and um, he went and started talking to him and he said, well, why don't you come and be our caretaker? We'll give you a job and we'll give you a home and we'll give you food. It was an incredibly powerful expression of what it meant to set the lonely in family, what it meant to set those on the margins right in the centre of all that we're doing. Okay, so the mission is to the fatherless, to the widows, to the prisoners, the poor. The purpose is not to set up a project to help them. The purpose is to bring them into the family. Final question we need to ask of this text in relation to our vision as a church is where is the home? Where's the sense of the presence of God? Well, it's right there at the beginning. Verse 5, we're told that God is a father to the fatherless. He's a defender of the widows. God is in his holy dwelling. Now, this was written in the time of the tabernacle where the priest would literally go in and the presence of God would be in the centre of the tabernacle. We know now that because of this new paradigm, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, his spirit lives in us. His presence and power is in us. And therefore, that's why we say we're most at home in the presence of God. But the whole point of this process of bringing people from the margins into the family is so that they encounter the presence of God. It's so that they encounter the life changing, transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we are not the answer to their problems. Money is not the answer 
to their problems doesn't mean we shouldn't give money and we shouldn't help them practically food is not the answer to their problems shelter is not the answer to their problems obviously they're all things that we should be doing as the family of god but the real answer to their problems is an intimate powerful loving hope-filled transforming relationship with god as their father it's coming into the presence of god so what do we need to do if that's who the lonely are, if that's what we're supposed to be bringing them into, if the presence of God is supposed to be the final goal for all of us and for those on the margins as much as it is for us, what do we need to do as a church? What should our response be here? Well, if you look out at the need around us, it very quickly becomes incredibly overwhelming. It almost feels like anything we do is a drop in the ocean and one of the fundamental values of us as a church is we only do what we see the father doing the whole point of being christians is that god can help us to be able to work out what it is we need to be doing at any particular time so that it doesn't feel like we're trying to do 101 things at once and we become overwhelmed by the need and there's some specific things that we feel as a church leadership that god is calling us into at this time the first is to set up something called love broccoli essentially to try and start an area of the church which is pure focused on social action which is purely focused on bringing those on the margins into the center into the family of God so that they can also encounter and enjoy the presence of God and we've been talking a bit about potentially in the future having a community center Hanau's dream has always been that church doesn't happen on Sunday church happens Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday and then on Sunday all we do is we share stories and we celebrate together church that's happened Monday to Saturday church is always supposed to be Monday to Saturday it'd be great to have a building that we can keep open all times and to be able to actually start to do different ministries in that building we've always had a dream of having a cafe in there that people can come to and interact with and we can have teams praying for people and giving prophecies for people we'd love to open a fully fledged debt center as a part of some of the cap initiatives that we're doing we'd love to offer free therapy and integrate more and more growing hope which i'll talk about in a minute we'd love to be able to start more classes and help people connect and help with this loneliness thing that's going on we need to do so much and in a sense we probably need another building that we can keep open as a community center the whole time we've been praying just so you know um for the old st peter's church hall which was sold in 2004 it's just across the way on crown Field Road and it was sold to the Indian Orthodox Church and I talked to um, the priests there quite a bit and they've outgrown that building now so they're looking for a new building in South East London. When that becomes available we'd love to buy that building and open it as a fully fledged community centre and start to respond to some of the initiatives that need to happen um, in and create this sense of family as St Peter's and obviously as a part of Love Broccoli we need someone who can coordinate that and it's become obvious to us as a leadership team um, since Anne White has been employed to be our administrator although she is amazing at administration the gift that she really brings to our team is an incredible amount of experience in this kind of era ministering to those on the margins and so we'd love to transition and out of the administration role into being able to oversee social action and pastoring um, in the church and as a result of that obviously we'll need to re-employ someone to do the admin and Anne is exceptional as I can imagine you realised when you heard her talk last week but what she also does which is so brilliant along with all the experience she brings she's amazing at listening to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit and the voice of God so that we only do what we see our father doing and we don't get overwhelmed so love broccoli we'd love to start out first thing that we're going to do to start love broccoli is to start a food bank i had a terrifying email from the lewisham food bank a couple of weeks ago that asked for urgent help because whereas lewisham food bank would normally only have 300 people would feed 300 people in a normal average week since the shutdown since the covid pandemic has really started taking grip here in southeast london that has trebled to 900 people and they're overwhelmed with the need there in the area so we're going to start a food bank here at st peter's st peter's broccoli food bank which is an inspired name i'm sure you'll agree and as a result of that we're going to start talking more about that this week Anne's going to do a video and we're going to start getting volunteers she put out a little feeler for that last week and we had 30 people sign up straight away to help do that so that's going to be brilliant and obviously we need to start funding that as well we are going to continue with our plans to open growing hope for those of you who don't know growing hope is an incredible charity started by someone called naomi at king's cross church and she is a trained occupational 
therapist and they provide free therapy for children um, with additional needs and support for families with children with additional needs because they've noticed that often people have help for a little bit of time in the NHS and then they fall through the cracks and so therefore she started this charity to start to try and pick up those children who have fallen through the cracks and they've been overwhelmed with the response they've had in King's Cross. We're going to start it here at St Peter's. That starts in September. We're going to be interviewing for a therapist come July time and we need to now start raising money for that charity they're going to be a separate charity and raise money themselves but as a church we'd love to give to it because it's going to be integral to what we're doing here and the therapist is going to be a part of our staff team so we need to start doing that also, Hanel has been particularly impacted by something called Home for Good. Many of you might know this amazing Christian charity that helps um, church families foster and adopt. Now, Lewisham is one of three councils in the whole country which is now partnered with Home for Good to try and locate families in churches who can house refugee children who don't have a home and so we were starting to talk to Home for Good about how we can integrate that into St Peter's and then when we're back from the lockdown we're going to start, talk more about that in the coming months. Also we have something here called the Fellowship Fund that members of the church family can apply to anonymously um, if they're in particular financial need and then there's an independent panel who assess how much to give and then we give it out. Um, I would love to widen this out so it's not just the church family. I'd love to be able to provide a fellowship fund for the local area for people who are particularly in financial need. Obviously, we'll do all the same checks and balances in terms of how people apply. But wouldn't it be amazing as an expression of what it means to love broccoli, to have this fund where people locally can come to and find help. This is just the start and as Anne transitions into this role, I'm sure we'll start to be led by the Spirit in lots of different ways and I'm sure you know where we're going always a vision Sunday we talk about giving in the church and how we can give financially to all that God is doing through us in order to do all of this we need the church to give money towards it now here's a really quick bit of teaching on giving from Jesus I will scan through this because you all know it if you don't know it, this is really quick so in Matthew 6 Jesus says this about money do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven for where your treasure is there your heart will be also no one he says can serve two masters either you'll hate one you'll love the other or you'll be devoted to one you'll despise the other you cannot serve both God and money what is Jesus saying there Jesus is saying that money and possessions has the power to function like a God in our life. If we give our devotion to it, essentially our worship, it defines how much we're worth. It defines our value. And so Jesus says that's incredibly dangerous. If we give money and possessions the power to do that, it will always leave us wanting because it can't fulfill those things. It isn't able to actually give us any sense of worth. People know this because they never have enough money, but you don't need to have much money to realize that money can't actually do that. Instead, Jesus says, give all of your life and your devotion and your love to God and he will satisfy your desires. He will give you that sense of worth and identity that you acquire. And to break the power of it, Jesus says, give your money to things of eternal value. Give your money to God. In fact, there's other teaching in the Bible where it's pretty obvious that we don't own anything anyway. All of our money and our possessions belong to God. Anyway, so how and to whom should we give? Well, if you are a member of the St. Peter's family, I'm very aware that a lot of people have joined us since the last gift day, vision day talk a number of months ago. Um, today, I just wanna ask, would you consider praying and asking God if you um, are to set up a standing order to give to St. Peter's broccoli. There's an expectation in the New Testament that Christians will set aside a proportion of their income to support the work of their particular church. And obviously in that teaching that Jesus just spoke to, this is a heart matter. It's not just a normal uh, practical matter of money and possessions. Where our money is there, our heart is also. And it naturally makes sense. If our heart is at St. Peter's, if we're a member of the family, then also we will be giving some money towards St. Peter's to try and support all that's happening here so would you consider praying about setting up a standing order how do we give will we give as the spirit leads we don't believe that any tithing law applies Jesus came to fulfill the law and therefore this idea that we give 10% of our income to church does not apply now we give as the spirit tells us to give however um, that doesn't quite let us off the hook in that as you read um, in the New Testament and the teaching on money Paul calls us to be hilarious givers absolutely outrageous and re reckless givers and as you read about the story of the early church in Acts and the 
way that they provide for each other it is above and beyond the tithe and so incredibly generous in a way that it completely does away with this idea that money and possessions act as a god and so therefore we do it as led by the holy spirit so we need to ask god how much and to whom we should be giving some proportion of our income and also it's worth saying that in acts so often when there's a time of crisis in the story of the early church the early church even though it's experiencing that crisis itself steps up and still gives to the poor still gives to the vulnerable i'm thinking of the famine that happens in acts and the church in jerusalem where they were incredibly poor themselves still raise money to give to those who are in need at the time and um, normally i would say this only applies to members of the st peter's church family but because of this weirdness of our streaming and lots of people watching who aren't members of the church family i'd encourage you also to give as the spirit leads obviously give a proportion of your income to your local church that you go to or you will be going to once lockdown finishes but also just be led by the holy spirit now here's a very important thing none of this applies to you if you are currently struggling financially because of the COVID pandemic. You should not feel guilty. You should not feel guilted or manipulated into giving money. If you are struggling, if you've lost your job, as I know some people are, please don't think that this applies to you in any way whatsoever. Instead, what I'd love you to do is I'd love you to apply to the fellowship fund. So I spoke about this earlier. If you would like to apply, you can do this anonymously by sending an email to Andy, only he will know, andy at stpetersbroccoli.org.uk, and then he sends it anonymously onto the panel who then assess it and then works out how we give money to those who are in need. So if you are in need and you're watching this, please could you email Andy and he will take things Things from there. So if you give to St. Peter's, specifically to St. Peter's Church, what will this go towards at the time? Well, here's where our giving comes from. Firstly, um, can't have a vision talk without a nice pie chart, particularly nice colours. 68% um, of our um, income comes from congregational giving. And because we have grown since the last gift day, our giving hasn't actually matched the amount of growth that we've seen. So that's why we're asking people who would consider themselves to be members to pray about giving regularly. It just helps us plan if you give by standing order. And 12% from grants, 10% from church activities, 10% from rentals. This is where it gets spent just really quickly. Um, operations, boring things like gas and electricity, things like that, keeping the building up and um, making sure operationally everything is working. I had the pleasure of turning off the gas the other day because we're not in church anymore. That is saving us money. So we'll put that towards mission. Um, here is worship. So that's everything that happens on Sundays, but also midweek related to worship staff, costs related to that, but also depreciation of PAAV, all the different things that we need in order to be able to do that. 90% on community, 12% on common fund, which goes back to the diocese to help pay my stipend. And then 6% on mission. We've actually raised that to 10% so that we're giving 10% of away. We give away to stuff like Wave and Tuesday, but also to amazing local charities such as Power the Fight, which helps tackle youth violence in the local area, but we give money away. Now, what I would like to happen as a result of this gift day is for that 10% to go right the way around so it matches worship and it matches community spending and expenditure so that we're able to start really making mission a massive part of our focus in the coming months. So how much do we need in order to be able to start some of these plans? Very hard to say, particularly when you consider the potential demand on the food bank. And I think what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to open up funding of the food bank to those local residents as well. Because when you look at the figures, they're eye-watering in terms of how much money we're going to need to be able to start that. But kind of initial startup costs will be about a K for the food bank. We've got about a 2K increase in operational costs to start Love Broccoli, start that ticking along. We need to raise a salary for a therapist once we start growing hope in the autumn term. We estimate that as a part of this gift day, and we do two gift days a year, we probably need about 30K from this gift day, either in standing orders over the year or as one-off gifts so as to start to get these things going. Some people like it when we break this down, helps give them a sense of what it might pay for. If you give a one-off gift today of £5,000, you'll pay off half of our youth bus. Now, currently our youth bus is just sitting there. In fact, I escape to the youth bus often to get a bit of solitude on my own. But the youth bus in the autumn term will start to be used massively in terms of youth mission in the local area. So that's what a one-off gift there. One-off gift of £1,000 will pay for the entire startup cost of the food bank, which we're going to be starting next week. Um, £500 a month by regular giving pays for four days of free therapy for children with additional needs in the local area who can't afford it. £200 a month will feed two adults through the St. Peter's Broccoli food bank for every day for that month. £100 a month will pay for an entire eight-week cap course, obviously when we start meeting up together, although they are carrying on 
online. £50 a month will pay for a bursary for children to do ballet who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford ballet. And £10 a month will pay for 10 non-perishable food bank items like baked beans, I imagine, um, from the food bank, which is very exciting. And we're going to speak, obviously, more and more and more about the food bank as we get things going. So... Um, who are we asking to give? Well, if you have become a member of the family and you're not yet giving to St. Peter's Broccoli, we'd love to ask you to pray as to whether you can start a standing order to the church. Standing orders are so much better for us so that we can plan in the coming months and years with our budget. Secondly, some people who have been coming a while and might want to pray and ask the Holy Spirit if God's asking you to give a one-off gift in particular. Um, sorry, asking you to increase your standing order so as to match your income again or so that you can give more generously in this time. Again, let me say, as I've said before, if you are struggling financially, none of this applies to you. Please do not feel guilted or shamed into giving um, particularly if you don't have enough and all of this is by the and through the holy spirit you have to ask god this isn't about being guilted into giving things some people prefer to give one-off gifts either you're already giving and it's easier to give a one-off gift at this time or your income is at such that you can only really do it as one-off gifts so that's the way you can do that as well so in a moment we're going to have time to pray whether we are being asked to do that here's how you give stpetersbroccoli.org.uk you can log into that right now online forward slash give and what you'll be what you'll be presented with is a form right there that looks just like that you can do the drop down either regular giving or one off and then you can choose um, how much you're going to give there in those two boxes if you could tick the gift aid declaration box if you are a uk taxpayer that gives us 25p on every pound that you give in addition so we can really benefit from the government because we're a charity on that so please do tick that if you're uk whoa uk taxpayer <laughs> that's water um and then finally your email address and then you'll be led through the steps as we go okay sorry that was particularly fast it always is because it's too much packing we're going to have a song now and during this song um the opportunity now is to ask the holy spirit um how and how much we should give if at all and so remember this is a work of the holy spirit we're to respond to what we feel like the spirit's asking us to do so i'm going to pass over to lucy now she's going to sing a song and let's be asking the holy spirit how we should respond to this vision sunday <laughs> <laughs> 